a Juego Contra Vinta. I'm Fernando. Uh, I work here as a developer. And uh, before starting the event, uh, I want to share you a couple of slides uh, that explains the what's a Devinta and what we do here. Uh, Devinta is a global online classification specialist, uh, and we operate in 11 countries. We have a purpose, mission, and vision. Uh, I have to read because it's a lot of text, but I trust. Uh, we make a positive change by helping everything and everyone uh, to find a, a new purpose by creating perfect matches on the world's most trusted marketplaces uh, with sustainable commerce shaping a healthy planet and society. At the maintain numbers, uh, we have uh, 2.5 billion uh, multi visits in all our, our, our portals. Uh, we are uh, 2,000 uh, employees, a little bit more. And we manage uh, 25 uh, product portfolios. In case of revenues on the vida, I think we are healthy. And uh, we mainly uh, operate in, in Europe, as you can see. Uh, in concrete, in, in Spain, uh, Milan is for uh, generalist uh, marketplace. Well, Coaches.net and Motors.net uh, or mobility portal. Autocasa and Habitaclia uh, for real estate and Infojobs is for uh, jobs portal. Uh, we usually work remotely, but uh, we have uh, offices like this office, and we have in Barcelona, Paris, Amsterdam, and Berlin. And <coughs> that's all. Uh, uh, you want uh, to know more about uh, Alvinta? We can uh, chat uh, after the event, uh, taking some drinks. And uh, this uh, event is uh, uh, thankfully uh, to Software Cast of Barcelona. Uh, I'm also a, a volunteer and uh, I want to share a couple of slides about Software Cast of Barcelona also. Uh, what we are? Uh, we are a community uh, of developers and uh, we want to share and improve our knowledge. knowledge. And uh, we agreed to the Software Cafan Team Manifesto. And uh, we are a non-profit uh, volunteer group uh, in, well, created in 2015 uh, with 2,000 members. And last year, uh, we became a non-profit association legally based in Barcelona. What we do, uh, we have an annual event uh, in October. And uh, also, uh, we do open spaces. It's like an conference and uh, workshops, katas, or in this case, uh, talks. If you want to to see uh, what's uh, what, what are we doing uh, with uh, coding dojos, this is our uh, query. And uh, maybe we do uh, twice a month or a little more. And if you are okay with the lights, okay. And uh, you want to follow us? Uh, there are our, uh, social links. And uh, that's all. Uh, in this case, I will want to introduce Sergey. It's for you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, how it is going to work? It worked. Perfect. So, my name is Sergey. I am an active participant of all Software Crafters Barcelona events. And during these events, actually, I found out that some people they don't know some things which are very crucial if we're talking about testing. And that's why I volunteered to make this presentation. And this presentation actually is mocks aren't stops. If you're familiar with the original articles by Martin Fowler, mocks aren't stops, this is a copy of this title. But I want to talk a little bit about what are the test doubles and how do we use them. 
And before we, we start, I want to thank Adevinta Spain for hosting this event. I want to appreciate experiencepatterns.com because this site is an online copy of a book, X Unit Framework and Patterns. And the owner of the site actually gave me the permission to use diagrams. So all these diagrams, they are under copyrights, but we can use them. So I have an official permission to do that. And many thanks for Software Crafters Barcelona for their existence and activities, because without them, these events wouldn't happen at all, I think. So a short disclaimer. The disclaimer is, it is about the object-oriented paradigm. Some patterns, they could be used in functional paradigm, but actually it's all about object-oriented paradigm. And this presentation it won't be very entertaining because it is packed with information. But Ima actually suggested to make it more entertaining by introducing some stories from the trenches. And that's why I want to start with the first story. So about five or four years ago, I don't remember, I have, I had, I had a fiery conversation with a guy and actually we were talking about test doubles and I tried to prove that spies exist. And the guy answered and the argument was, I don't use them during my development process, so they don't exist. And that was like a solid argument, but I wasn't really agree with this argument, so I started to dig this topic. And I found a lot of very interesting things about testing and especially test levels. And why it is important and actually the goal of the whole presentation, one, when for the first time I read this prominent article of Martin Fowler, this article was, it was written in very simple words so you can understand something like spy, you can understand some awkward object, but without additional context, without understanding some things, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So this presentation is going to introduce, so we can see this article as an iceberg, and the article presents like a top of the iceberg, and this presentation is going to introduce a little bit from the depth of this whole big topic about testing and test doubles. So about me, I'm a web developer with a wide range of interests. I am passionate about craft and testing, TDD and some variations. I'm an open source contributor and constant learner. Agenda, we're going to recap unit testing in general. We're going to talk a little bit about organization of a unit test. We're going to talk about verification patterns, which are very important to understand the test doubles. We're going to talk a little bit about dependency injection because I found something interesting. Then I'll introduce test doubles, a small example app. Then we're, to, we're going to talk about testing strategies and final thoughts. Recap of unit testing. So what is unit testing? In computer programming, unit testing is actually a software testing method by which individual units of source code are tested to determine whether they are fit for use. And these units, they could be very different from different points of view. And I'll touch this topic a little bit later but I want to mention that there are a very important thing about unit testing and when you write a unit test, you need to keep in mind the important attributes of a good unit test. These are going to be attributes and a little bit later I'll introduce the characteristics. 
So attributes. There is an acronym, first. And there are two schools of thoughts about this first acronym. First, it could be fast, isolated, repeatable, self-verifying, and timely. So fast, all unit tests should be very fast, ideally super fast, because if they are very slow, nobody is going to use them. They should be isolated, and it depends on the way of thinking. They should be repeatable and idempotent. And idempotent means that with the same input, they should provide the same result. Or we can think about no side effects is another characteristics of item potency. Self-verifying. So self-verifying to me is something like they should be very simple. So they, just, they should just provide fail test. And you don't need to think a lot about what has happened, why, no, it's just green or red and nothing else. And timely. Timely is a very interesting characteristic. It's when you write code, you need to think about writing tests. So your code should be covered with tests. If you use TDD, obviously you are going to cover your code base with tests. If you don't, well, you need to think about probably some integrational test upfront or about some smoke test, probably, but something, something that gives you understanding and gives you like support for your future development. Yes, I'm going to share it. Another way of thinking about first is actually fast is stands for fast, as usual. I, I stands for independent. And this way of thinking is independent, so the test should be independent. And that's a very important because, for example, if you have a global state, your tests are lucky or your tests are not secure. If you don't have security of your test, if you are not sure about your tests, you are not sure about your product, and that's very important to keep in mind. Tell verifying is the same, but T stands for thorough, and thorough is a very interesting concept which you actually have to keep in mind. It stands for you need to test all happy paths and fail paths. You need to try to test all the edge cases if you can. You need to try to test invalid and illegal input if your language is like dynamic language. And you need to test for large and insecure values. And large values is an interesting concept. Here we have Manuel Rivero, who is another active participant of the community. And during one of the events, he actually shared or pointed out the TDD guided by zombies. And this is another perspective that you might use for looking at unit testing. And this is a very interesting concept. There is a video, TDD Guided by Zombies by James Grenin. I highly recommend watching it. So the idea that zombies stand for zero, one, many, it's pretty simple. So you start with a simplest case, which is zero, when you cover one something, if it is a collection, for example, then many. And this part is probably the most important. So you need to think about boundaries behavior, you need to think about interfaces, and you need to think about exception exercise. Exercise means testing. Simple scenarios, simple solutions. Amazing video. So thank you very much, Manuel Rivero. That was very useful. A unit test. A block of code that verifies the accuracy of a smaller, isolated block of application code. The diagram might look simple or even stupid, but pay attention that the test code actually depends on the code. And this dependency, a lot of people don't think about this dependency, but this dependency is can be your test could be very highly coupled and if they are very highly coupled 
you have a lot of problems, especially with refactoring. And if you have problems with refactoring, that's bad news because your application is viscous, your application is hard to update and maintain. So keep in mind that test is always depend on code. And the level of dependency could be different, but we are going to talk a little bit about it. So about unit testing, we can write unit test manually and reinvent the wheel, but it is better to remember about a huge experience accumulated by our industry and refer to it. And we can talk about X unit patterns or frameworks. But before we dive into X unit framework, I want to mention two things that historically unit testing or a unit test was a unit of work. Today, a lot of people think that actually a unit test is like for one class, but it's not true, literally, because it depends on your way of thinking. It depends on the school that you use while you write the tests. And actually, unit test can be used for a component. And that's a, an interesting idea to think about. And as I've mentioned before, there are very important characteristics. I'll update the presentation a little bit later. So the characteristics, the tests, they should be like a protection against regressions. Regressions means errors or mistakes. They should be resistant to refactoring because if you refactor your code and your testing code base fails, well, that's a problem. They should be, they should give fast feedback and they should be maintainable. So remember that even if you write your unit tests and you think that everything is okay, it is a good idea to make sometimes a revision and you wouldn't believe, but there is a term refactoring of tests. And in some companies, refactoring of tests is an important part of the de development process. So here I want to mention that a lot of people think that code is an asset, but code is not an asset. Code is responsibility. So any code that you've written, it's your responsibility in some case or in some way. So that's very important to know, I think. Okay. X-Unit Framework. X-Unit Framework was written by Kent Beck. It was written for Smalltalk. If you want to be very deep in object-oriented paradigm and you like object-oriented paradigm, I highly recommend reading a book which is called Best Practices of Smalltalk, which was written by Kent Beck. And uh, actually, the majority of object-oriented languages came from, partially came from Smalltalk, and that's very interesting. So what is the X-Unit Framework? The X-Unit Framework is a agnostic, language agnostic framework to write and use tests. And before we dive into this X unit framework and the test doubles, and the test doubles is the important part of this X unit framework, we need to go through the vocabulary because the vocabulary is going to give us the possibility to understand what is hap happening here. And by the way, these diagrams to me are very important to understand. Why? Because actually they give you a high level view of what happens during you test your code. And that's a very interesting feeling when you see that, for example, you have a framework, a testing framework, which forces you to put some code in teardown stage, 
and you think, okay, so in teardown stage, we need they need to clean up the fixture somehow. So it doesn't make sense. And that's a very interesting feeling when you understand how it works in general. So it's like a machine to me. Vocabulary, <clears throat> test runner. So test runner is pretty simple stuff. A test runner is an executable program that runs tests implemented using an XUnit framework and reports the test results. The test results could be red or green. Test class, test case class, a test that contains test methods. And actually, there are different ways of thinking about it. So you can write a test class for a class, or you can write a test class for a feature, or you can write a test case class for a fixture. Well, I am accustomed to write for a class, obviously. A test method. A test method is a test that exercises one or more test conditions. Usually, one condition per test. If you see a lot of conditions in your test, well, that's a code smell. That probably you need to think that this test does too much, and it is related to single responsibility principle as usual. Test condition. Test condition is something we need to prove the SUT or system under test really does. But sometimes it can be done indirectly. And we are going to cover this topic about indirect testing. So the test condition can be described in different ways. It's not very important. The most important that is something we need to prove the SUT does. Fixture. A fixture is a very vague term. I saw a lot of definitions. So my understanding is actually a text fixture, uh, fixture, sorry, a test fixture is actually a test context. Is the set of preconditions and states needed to run a test. So before every test, we need to set up this fixture and we need to and we need to set up a good state that's important because if we set up a bad state our test won't work and we need to return to the original state after the test each test constructs its own brand new text fixture that's ideally some frameworks actually work a little bit different without actually there are shared fixtures it's not very important the most important is that there is a fixture and your sut grabs or takes everything from this fixture everything that it needs to do so for example parameters if you want specific parameters you provide them into the test and that's a part of fixture that's important to understand SUT, SUT or system under test, short for whatever thing we're testing. According to the original definition, it can be a class or a method on the test unit level, or it can be a major subsystem or even the entire application on a higher level. So as I've said, this XUnit framework and these patterns could be used for any level of testing pyramid before using them in integration tests you need to think does it fit or not but in general some patterns they are applicable doc dependent on components components sorry dependent on components is any part of the application or system we are building that is not included in the set but still required to run our test because it is called by the set or because it's set up prerequisites data that the SUT will use. And why I pay so much attention to these two SUT and DOC, because actually this part is for test doubles. When you use test doubles, you substitute this DOC part. And that's important to understand that actually you Substitute dependent on components. Test double. 
is any object or component that we install in place of a real component specifically for that we can run a test. And here, this is a perfect diagram that client relies on DOC, but on the creational stage, we substituted this DOC with test doubles and our system under test uses test doubles. And we sometimes cannot control this dependent on components, but we are in total control of test doubles. So that's why we can control the test and we can make test, tests predictable. And that's the most important part. For phase test, I'm going to elaborate this idea, but in short, each test method implements a four-phase test that ideally verifies a single test condition. Second part, organization of unit tests, of a unit test. So I think a lot of people here know well-known patterns like triple A or GVT, GVT. So, AAA stands for arrange, act, assert. We arrange something, we act on the SUT, and we assert the result that SUT returns us. DVT is almost the same pattern, but we are using it in behavior during development. And it is like the same idea, but we are looking at the system from a higher level a little bit. And even here, you can see the difference that for the unit test, I used it can sum two numbers. For the behavior test, it should sum two numbers. So even, e, even when you look at the new code base, testing code base, you can find some hints what actually the author tried to convey with these ideas. So to me, I usually use it can or it could for unit test, it, it should, it generally it should for behavioral test. But a lot of people never heard about four phase test. And actually, four phase test is a high level concept or of these triple A and GVT. It's the main idea is actually your test before exercise the system under test. It uses four different phases. And these phases are fixture setup. So you somehow populate the fixture. You exercise SUT. You verify the results. And you tear down the fixture. That's a very high level concept because in a lot of frameworks, these parts could be separated. So in the majority of X unit frameworks, there are additional or specific setup methods and teardown method. So there are two methods which are in charge of setting up and tear down the fixture. But you can literally set up something or add to your fixture during the exact test. So it, it's good to know that how it should work. Verification patterns. Verification patterns, this is a topic which is quite boring, but we need to go through it. So test automation is about verifying the behavior of the SUT. And some aspects of the SUT's behavior can be verified directly when we check the outputs, when we make assertions on the outputs of SUT. This is a direction way, direct way. But sometimes we don't have such a possibility. And in this case, we verify something indirectly. And when we verify something indirectly, we need 
to use some objects. So state verification, we inspect the state of a system under test after it has been exercised and compare it to the expected state or in short assertion. Behavior verification, we capture the indirect outputs of the SUT as they occur and compare them to the expected behavior, in short, expectations. So I'm going to skim through these two slides. The most important, as usual, diagrams. So in this diagram, we can see that we exercise the SUT, this SUT does something, and it returns the state. And we verify the state. And this is a simple idea that this is state verification. So we did something with SUT, we verified the expected state. Behavior verification. We exercised SUT. We provided somehow the DOC objects to this SUT. So we populated somehow this fixture and our SUT has used this substituted DOC. And then we verify the behavior of SUT here. And this distinction is very important because this is the borderline between tabs and mocks. Tabs are for state verification, mocks are for behavior verification. Do you have any questions? Are you sleeping? <laughs> okay. So, some interesting stuff. Dependency injection. Before this presentation, I thought that I know almost everything about dependency injection, but that's actually not true. And I think I have a lot to learn more about it. So, in software engineering, dependency injection is a programming technique in which an object or function receives other objects or functions that it requires, as opposed to creating them internally. Dependency injection is the key to modular, loosely coupled, and reusable code. Besides, using dependency injection, we can create a flexible software which conforms to open-close and dependency inversion principles. But the interesting part is the types of dependency injection. So, so we have constructor injection, which is pretty simple. So our SUT receives the dependencies at the constructor layer, layer or level and save them to a field. We have property injection. It's a setter where we can even populate or provide a dependency through the public field. But public field, I think everybody knows that this is a anti-pattern, so don't do that. We have parameter injection. When the SUT receives uh, a dependency as a parameter to a method and uses it, uses it inside the method. But there are other types of dependency injections, and I think the majority of you knows about the container, which is pretty famous pattern. There are service locator and the containers, container, two patterns, which are pretty famous among the different frameworks. But besides, we have factory class and we have a local factory method and we have different variations. And why it is important? Because you can create different layers of injection. So you can inject directly, but on the other hand, if you need more flexibility, you can inject a factory and this factory is going to create something for you. And in test environment, it could create something very interesting. Same with the container, by the way. So in the majority of frameworks during testing, you can substitute some entities in the container with your test doubles. How many of you know about SIM? SIM. By the way, dependency injection is not enough. Why it's not enough? Because actually here, 
it's nothing said about the abstraction. So dependency ejection, it could be when you provide a class and that's all. You are not flexible. You are tightly coupled to a class and that's all. And the important term is sim. This sim was introduced by Michael Fevers. He is an author of How to Work with Legacy Code, the very famous book. So the original idea is from our real life. The joining of two pieces of cloth of leather by sewing, usually near the edges. And if we're talking about programming, a seam is a place where you can alter behavior in your program without editing in that place. In other words, a seam is a place in the code that you can insert a modification of your behavior. And we create seams when we want to introduce another behavior and seams have an intrinsic, very profitable effect. They hide the complexity. So I think the majority of you heard the principle program to an interface, not an implementation, which was coined by Eric Gamma one time before. So actually, this is the theme. When in your language you use or interface or an abstract class, you introduce an abstraction. And when you have an abstraction, you can provide different implementations. And this is a very important picture. As I said, themes hide the complexity. So here, the class under test, it has three different dependencies. And for example, this dependency has another dependency and another dependency and another dependency, etc., etc., etc. It's too complex. If you want to cut all your complexity, you just introduce a theme. There is a refactoring pattern, something like change class to interface. I don't remember, but it is well known in testing world. So the idea is that if you feel that something is going to change here in the future, or if you feel that something is too complex here, Probably it's time to introduce here a theme. So, as I said, theme implies themes imply abstraction and allow us to benefit from design my contract. How many of you heard about design by contract? Perfect. So, I highly recommend you Google about design by contract. This is a not very simple, but a quite simple idea that your abstraction that you introduce on a theme, well, in the original work by Mayers, he didn't write anything about themes, but he wrote about abstraction. And imagine that your abstraction actually behaves as a person who have to follow a contract. So you literally describe the contract, the parameters and the return types and probably some interface uh, exceptions, sorry, some exceptions or some events. There are a lot of things to think about the contract, but I highly recommend you at least reading about design by contract because it helps make your development more maintainable and more understandable. So test doubles. <clears throat> finally, finally, after all this stuff, we reached test doubles. So test doubles are generic term for any kind of pretend object used in place of a real object for testing purposes. The name comes from the notion of a stunt double in movies. You don't need to read all this stuff. It's for the presentation because I'll provide the information for every test double. So a dummy object. A dummy is a placeholder object that is passed to the SUT as an argument or an attribute of an argument but it's never actually used. Java, it can fetch a fact. We're going to 
examine this short application. So we have a fetcher, we have an assessor, we have a notifier, but for our test, we don't need a notifier for it now. So we introduce a dummy notifier and dummy notifier is actually a notifier which does nothing literally. So you can throw an exception if you want, if your business requirements, if you need to check if it literally wasn't called. But in general, it's like dummy, you don't pay attention, it's something like that have no behavior, that's all. Fakes. We're not going to talk a lot about fakes, but a fake is a replace of, re, the fake replaces a component that the system under test depends on with a much lightweighter implementation. Here, I mentioned before that we have two patterns. We have state verification and behavior verification. And fake is a state verification. So we provide the fake object to the fixture. SUT, while exercising, uses the data from this fixed fake object. And then, actually, we verify the SUT. So we verify a state of SUT, and that's all. The most prominent or the most famous example of fake object is in memory database. I think a lot of people even used this on memory database because it's faster, but it could be almost anything. Subs. We replace a real object with a test-specific object that feeds the desired indirect inputs into the system under test. And this is state verification pattern. So the interesting moment about subs that you literally have two options. You can create a hard-coded sub, or you can use a framework. And even if in the book, in the book I'll, I will mention later, even in the book there is a chapter dedicated to hard-coded stubs. In some companies, as I said, some stories from the trenches. In Russia, I visited a company and they had a lot of tests and the majority of tests was dependent on the test stubs which were hard coded so they had a folder with fixture fixtures and for example user tab and you always knew that when you ask a user tab for a name it returns anonymous and that's all Pretty simple stuff, but it is lightning fast if it is hard coded. So this is an interesting point to note. So some code is going to be in PHP. Sorry, guys. However, besides the dollar mark, it is almost Java. So as I said, we replace an object. So here we have a mock, oh, sorry, we have a stop. And this is a very interesting, actually. So you can see the discrepancy. Fetch your stop, create mock. In some frameworks, you don't even have create stop method. In PHP unit you have, but I did it intentionally because it's not the framework, but you who actually describes the exact test double because here we have a we don't have any expectations and we are going to reach the expectations on the next slide so when you don't have any expectations and you just return something when a method is called it is called a stub pretty simple stuff so do you remember a range act assert, a range stage, act stage, assert stage? Pretty simple. Actually, I prefer to use these structural patterns like AAA to write all my tests. So it 
reveals my intentions. Some notes on stops. They, as I've mentioned, they can be hard coded. Sometimes the stops can give a false positive, especially because of TDD and hard code. How many of you heard about transformational premises? What is it called? Transformation premises in TDD. TPP, it is called. Yes. So, this you can Google like CPP in TDD. It stands for a you have a feed where you have a result result values or return values. And for example, if your method doesn't, if you are thinking about which actually return data you have to use on the next step, you have this pretty defined sheet where you can find the next easiest return data that can you use. And this is a very good technique, but however, there is a downside because stops, they don't actually test the behavior they are aware of behavior they don't know nothing about they don't anything they don't know anything about behavior so once i hard coded something and i was distracted and i actually forgot to update this hard coded return value I covered everything with stops and everything worked perfectly until it went to production. So that's an interesting point. Another point that step data should be very different from your expected data. So for example, here, I didn't yet present the application, but it is going to be the application that actually asks the public API about some facts about cats and grabs a fact and assess this fact. So for example, here, return value fact cat is to me, it's sort of anti-pattern because we are expecting to get a cat here because a fact about cat it's highly likely that it contains a word cat. So we can use a word test or we can use something like gibberish and it is going to be better because these returned or step data should be very far from your real data. And that's a good idea in my opinion. Mocks. Oh, mocks actually I had very tough time, tough time to wrap my head around this idea of mocks. It was like a nightmare. I watched different videos. It was a long time ago, but I remember that I watched different videos and I couldn't wrap my head how it works, how. But with this diagram, it is very easy to understand. So mocks, replace an object that SUT depends on with a test specific object that verifies it is being used correctly by the SUT. Well, here it's not only correctly how it was being used by the SUT. And this is a behavior verification. So diagram, diagram is pretty good in this case. So you set up a mock object somehow, it doesn't matter. So your mock object is in fixture and it substitute a DOC object. Then your SUT calls something on your mock object and the mock object can verify this behavior or you can verify it after the SUT worked. And that opens us the route to the spice.
because the difference between MOX and SPICE that actually MOX in general, they check the expectations here and they can break your tests. Tabs cannot break your test. Spice cannot break your test if they are really spies. But Mox can break your test. And this is probably the most obvious distinction to understand in the difference between all the test doubles and why Mox are so special, because they literally can break your test. Oh, so we have a mock feature mock, and we set an expectation. When we set an expectation, we expect that this method is going to be called by the SUT. And here we can provide how many times. Uh, in some frameworks, you can see something like twice times three times 100. Don't do this. I mean, if your you need to expect that your SUT calls an object inside something like 100 time, something wrong with your design, for sure, to me. The idea is the same. So we arrange the mock object, we provide this mock object to the SUT, and we here we assert. But actually, this assertion stage is not necessarily needed, by the way. And I am going to show the code. So you can think, you can think differently about it. In the PHP community world, it's okay. But in general, it's not okay. In general, because if you test a mock, you test a mock. If you test an expectation, you test an expectation. If you were uh, assertion, sorry. If you test the assertion, you test the assertion. If you want to test the assertion, you stop. If you want to test the behavior and expectation, use mock. Some notes on mocks. White box, black box testing. Does it ring a bell? Perfect. So mux, they are white box testing something. They know too much about the internal structure of your code. And that's a pain. A pain because if you want to refactor your SUT, you could have some hard time. And here, I want to point out that use mocks if your abstraction is stable. It's the same like uh, open close principle. Use open close principle when you have a stable abstraction. Use mocks when you have a stable abstraction so you won't have hard time. Probably you are going to have hard time, but it's not highly likely. But if, for example, you just experiment with a new domain or you experiment with a new idea, try not using mocks at all because mocks, they are not bad. A lot of people think that mocks are bad. No, they are not bad. They do they work. They do they work well, but you need to know when and how to use them. And as I've mentioned previously, mocks can break your tests. Spice. Spice in, in interesting concepts. And so it's a death double that we use to capture the indirect output calls made by another component by the system under test to later verification by the test. And this is behavior verification. So we set up. A test spy, we provide this test spy to the fixture, we substitute the DOC, we exercise the system under test, the system under test uses this test spy somehow, and we verify something on the spy. We don't verify the system under test. We ask, we ask, sorry, we ask test spy 
what ha has happened? How this testpy was used? And this is the code. And as you can see, if we were talking about white testing, spies are probably the worst example of white box testing because they literally knows should know everything about the system so in uh, php php unit pattern uh, sorry php unit framework we don't have spies so we offer of php unit he deprecated all the method that could be used as spice because he against the spice he's against the spice so if you want to use a spy in php you use mockery library so we create a notifier spy we provide this notifier spy to our checker we exercise or we act we make our sut to work and then we check our expectations but we check it on the spy so here we check that notifier spy should have received so it was called with a method notify with such arguments why it is important to know because we are going to see it in the real app it's not like real app but it could be a real app some notes on spies they lead to brittle test so this test refactor this test is a nightmare for sure it is going to fail for sure so this is called over specification over specification is when your test knows almost everything about your system under test and this test is brittle brittle means that you touch it and it fails and that's all However, the spies are best for protocols. How many of you know about protocols? Perfect. <laughs> so what is protocol? In programming, you have API. And what is API? The API is a set of signatures. So if we're talking about object-oriented paradigm, you have an object, it could be like an abstraction or it could be a real object it doesn't matter in this case in this case you have an object and this object has public methods private methods protected methods and this is this is in api by the way private methods are not considered to be api but protected methods are considered to be api by the way so when you write some protected methods think about that you couple your implementation to your children not your children but the children of your object what is a protocol protocol for the first time i read there is a book design interfaces in programming i don't remember i'll definitely include this book in the list of recommendations so the protocol is when your object should be called in a specific sequence in this specific sequence for example if you have an orm in orm in some orms which are active records if you want to remember a data you need to update the data before and then you save and this is a protocol because if you want to achieve something you need to call the sequence the exact sequence of methods and this is a protocol that's not an api api it stands for the whole signatures public and protected but the protocol is more about behavior how the methods should be called then you want to achieve something <clears throat> so spies are very good are the best tool to check protocols mock or step so sometimes you have a step which actually expect something to happen or you can look at this from the other perspective you have 
a mock that returns a step data. What is it? It is a mock because mock or behavior verification has a higher priority. So if you included some expectations, your test double becomes a mock point. Ah, by the way, sorry. If you see something like a mixture of mock and stop, it could be a code smell. So it's a code smell. It's something like you need to think about, or probably I need to write two tests and split one test to two tests, probably. Some principles, I just want only to name them. These are principles that I actually heard somewhere. The first one, don't mock that you don't own. And the second one is don't mock SUT, even partially. Don't mock SUT is an adage by Sandy Metz, a very interesting author from the Ruby community, and even partially came from Java world. Why it is bad practice to mock something partially? Because if you are coupled to a state, when you partially change the state, it can break invariance inside the class or it can break the expected behavior. An example application. So there is a perfect book. I think a lot of you knows, the majority of you knows, the book which is called Refactoring by Martin Fowler. And in this book, I, I like very much the sentence that Martin Fowler said that he feels always sleepy when somebody makes a presentation, but until somebody shows a code. And it's not going to be a, like a workshop, a real workshop, but I'm going to present a short application and I'm going to upload it for like testing purposes. So an example application, the goal, provide an interesting fact about cats, evaluate its truthness and give a score. The process, we fetch a fact about cats from the public API. Then we use an algorithm to check the reliability of a fact and we give a fact score. The output, the fact with the score and the opinion. The requirements. This is the most important. So what are the requirements? There are many requirements, but the most important are should lock incorrect interaction with the public API when a receiver, sorry, when it receives a JSON and this JSON is unexpected, it notifies CTO about the problem via email, it notifies programmers about the problem via email, and it notifies programmers about the problem via Slack. Why? Because previously our production server didn't work for two days because nobody knew about the problem. So the CTO was like furious and this business requirement appears. As you can see, it seems to be a sequence of some behavior. And when we have a sequence of behavior, we use spice. Diagram. I like diagrams because actually there are two famous ways of drawing diagrams is UML diagram. There are 21 diagram in UML and there is C4. Only C4 architecture something. There are only four diagrams, but I like UML diagrams. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to make a, a interaction diagram, but I'll include it in the presentation. So an ideal app, an ideal app, we would separate concern responsibilities. So here we have, that's interesting. Then even when you are looking at the diagram, you can see that you literally have some components and these components here, they are pretty obvious. You have a fetch service, which actually fetches 
the data from the public API and you have an accessory. So this is an assessor service, but the problem is that if I'm going to separate all the concerns, I am going to introduce the clear boundaries, I'm going to provide the value objects through these boundaries, et cetera, et cetera, it is going to be very complex. So you won't see the test doubles behind the trees. So I had to make it less complex. And that's a very interesting experience because when you think about it, you think about responsibility here and here. But when you contract it in this way, this responsibility partially creeps here. And you are going to see that here the code is almost awful. However, it is a code which is covered with tests and everything is okay. But this is a very interesting proof that separation of concerns or single responsibility principle leads to a good design. And I'll show the code and it is easier to show. Two nodes. Here we have a sim, obviously. So we can use the fault feature, we can use curl feature, dumb feature, anything. Here we have another sim. And why we have the sim? Because here we have an aggregation of scores. And the business logic of this scorer is not so obvious. We have two different scores and they are aggregated here and they work somehow. So, but this diagram is very important because looking a little bit upfront, we have two schools. We have London school and Chicago school. And in London school, you mock almost everything. In Chicago school, you don't mock everything. This part, we won't mock in Chicago school or classicist school, but we are going to mock it with London school or what is it called? Classicist and mockist. In mockist school, we are going to mock it. In classical, in classicist school, we are not going to mock it. So what can go wrong? And that's a very interesting question. Do you usually ask yourself before implementing something? So here we have an unpredictable nature of API. When we have an API, a lot of things can happen. But here we don't have nothing, literally. So let's explore it. Feature component problems and exceptional conditions, error requesting data without unspecific, unspecified reason, error requesting data due to a timeout, an empty JSON, an invalid JSON, and unexpected JSON. Assessor components, problem and exceptional conditions. They don't exist. You just provide an empty string, it returns zero score. You provide some gibberish, it returns zero score or something, but it doesn't have any exceptional conditions at all. And that's an interesting point to mention here. So in the original article, in the original article, I mean, stops aren't mock, there is a term which stands for, or the term is awkward object. And what is an awkward object? And that's very interesting that Martin Fowler, unfortunately, he didn't explain what is an awkward object, but from these two lists, we can definitely see that this is an awkward object. It is hard to work with this object, and it is easy to work with this object. If we want to elaborate a little bit, so the awkward objects, they there is a term which is called out of process. 
So out of process is everything outside of your application. If you have database, you have API, I mean, some external API, you have something else outside of your application that's awkward. You need to mock it, even in classicist approach. If it is hard to set up, it requires something like 50 dependencies. It's awkward, mock it. If it depends on 10 components, well, it is obviously a bad design, but it's awkward, mock it or stub it or mock it. Well, the term mock, I don't, I don't know even why, but in general, in our industry, people use mock for any test double. Well, after this presentation, you are going to use mock, but you are going to think a little bit upfront, is it a stub or mock or probably a spy or something else. So organization of tests. A list of interesting places to pay attention to. So I had this list and we can briefly go through. Error requesting data without unspecified reason. If we want to emulate an exceptional condition, we use stub. That's interesting. How is it possible to show the code? Let's try. First thing, run the tests. They are green. Perfect. Okay. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> Is it better? Okay. It could. Thank you. So it can handle a request error. What do we use here? Here we use a stub. Here I used a method create stub. So I reveal my intention. I have a feature stub and this feature stub, it actually throws a request error exception. And by doing this, I can check this condition. So the logic of the application, we have actually only two public methods. We have public method, which is random fact. And that's all for now. So I try to separate the logic, like to make the methods not so dull to read. However, as you can see, as I've mentioned before, when you try to put all the responsibilities somewhere, like separate the responsibilities between code, the code becomes dull to read. It's too much code here for me. So we have a fetch fact, fact method, which is actually uses a fetcher. And this fetcher, here we have an interface. And what interesting about this interface that actually this is a design by contract. It's not literally designed by contract, but it's something like something similar to design by contract, and I'll explain. Ideally, ideally, you have to return a JSON object. So you have to return a value object with JSON or a value object with processed JSON 
it doesn't matter. The problem here is string is a primitive data type, so you cannot check if it's valid or not. So you kind of move re the responsibility to check the data to the client, and this is a very bad practice. But because we are limited in code, we are limited in objects, we want to make everything compact, we actually use some dirty ways of writing code. So what is the design by contract? As I've mentioned previously, we have two parameters. The first one is a string, and it is the URL. In a strict design by contract, this URL should be an object with a validated URL. We have a return string, which is JSON, and we have some runtime exception. Why runtime exception? Because a lot of things could happen, so I used a general exception. However, the strict design by contract, you pick to one exception, probably two different exceptions, and you don't use general exception at all. So how it works? Here we have a fetch fetcher we call a fetch. It catches, we use try catch, it catches the runtime exception and log special cases. Here we don't log it, but here we throw an exception. And the interesting moment here that I wanted to explain is literally how you could, give me a sec, so how you could emulate, okay, how you could emulate this special condition, how you can make this feature fail with a network error. Call a server administrator? No, you cannot do that. What could you do? Like, uh, unconnect from the internet? No, that's very stupid. And this is where we can use test doubles. And here we can use actually our tab. And this tab expect, well, there is no any expectations. So if this tab is called with fetch, it returns new exception, request error, that's all. And using it, we can literally check the, this is a range stage. This is act stage. So no, a range, a range. This is a range two, sorry. So this is a range stage. So we create a stub we provide this stop to a fact checker and we know that it throws an error but when an error happens we expect a specific behavior from the system and this behavior we assert here so we have a check random fact when we call a random fact method with and we are sure that inside the system under test, something has thrown an exception, our system under, under test could return an error string with request error. So here we assert the behavior of SUT, how it behaves on in the case of the exceptional situation here. And that's an interesting example of how we can use actually tabs to verify the correct behavior of a system under test in exceptional situations. By the way, what time is it? Okay. So, as I've said, I'm going to upload this repo. It is going to be PHP, Java is partially done and TypeScript. But let's explore two interesting things here. The first interesting thing is actually here, an unexpected JSON. 
you should remember that we have a very specific business requirements here. So if the JSON is of unexpected format or something ha has happened with this JSON, we need to notify CTO, programmers, programmers by different means. And that's a very interesting place where we can use spy. But don't be afraid, the test is also. Okay, where it is. Okay. <laughs> Next time, <laughs> let's go through the presentation. This is a very interesting thing to think. I mean, when you have an application and you plan your application, think about the things that can go wrong and try to think ahead a little bit how you are going to test them. And this is probably an important part of this presentation that you literally can make lists of some floppy things and think a little bit upfront how you are going to test them. Testing strategies. As I mentioned before, and it is written in the article, so there are two different schools, classicist and mockist. Classicist school is called Chicago school or Detroit school. Mockist school is called London school. So classicist is to use real object if possible and a double if it's an awkward situation or it's awkward to use the real thing. Mockist, always use a mock for any object with interesting behavior. Interesting, in this case, it means behavior in general. Here, we need to look for two different terms, which are good to know. So do you remember that unit testing is method by which individual unit of code are tested to determine blah, blah, blah. So the question is, what is the unit? And it depends on the school. So in classical, in classicist school, if these class classes are not awkward, if they don't make side effects, if they are not out of process, you can leave them. So the main idea, the main idea, if you see that you work with inputs and outputs, and this is quite predictable, in classes of school, you don't use mocks. You literally test all this thing, and it is called sociable test. Sociable because it is, it is sociable. It knows a lot of people around. Solitary test. Solitary test is when you substitute all the dependencies with mocks. These are very simple terms, but they are good to know because actually I stumbled upon these terms and I didn't know what does it mean, solitary test. Uh, <laughs> so, as I've mentioned previously, in mockist, in London school or mockist approach, you are going to mock this, you are going to mock this. In Chicago school, Chicago school, or classical approach, you are going to mock this, but you are going to use the real object here. Why? Because this part is all about inputs and outputs. You provide some inputs and it provides some outputs. Nothing very special. And final thoughts. So, the more, one of the interesting ideas, as I showed previously in the code, that, for example, here, oops, fetcher mock, create mock. But previously, I used fetcher stop, create mock. This is semantics. This 
naming is my intention. So when you want to introduce a stub, use stub. When you want to introduce a mock, use mock in the naming of variables. It is going to simplify your code drastically, literally. After this presentation, we read the original article with all this new knowledge. And well, I bet that it is going to be read in a very different way, literally. Books, XUnit patterns, and my appreciation to xunitpatterns.com that they gave the permission to use the diagrams. The book of my compatriot, Vladimir Horikov, Unit Testing Principles, Practices and Patterns, a very good book, literally. And the book from our guys from Kadurans, Patronas Comunes Que Dificultan El TDD. There is, this book is translated in English too. So these are books that I want to suggest reading after this presentation. And that's all. Any feedback, any questions? No questions, it's strange. Well, guys, it's a tough topic, a lot of new information, I know. So it takes time to settle down all this information, but it's not so tough or it's not so complex. Just read the X unit test patterns book. It has everything you need to know about unit testing. Read this book. It is more like a high level view and these are like patterns of TDD and anti-patterns. And actually keep in mind when you write code, keep in mind that there are first acronym, there are zombies, and there are patterns, anti-patterns. And your code are going to be the best one code in the universe. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, we have some drinks and, and food uh, in the other side of the building uh, to do uh, some networking. And welcome to, to coming for coming.